Lord, in this text, your inspired word, hold forth Christ. Help us to see in the consecration of the firstborn, in the feast of unleavened bread, in the bones of Joseph, and in a pillar of cloud and fire, Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. When I was in my early 20s, I spent three summers at a camp on the Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri, and this was what you might call a roughing it kind of camp. This was uh, off the beaten path, you know, off the highway, off the subset highway, off the county road, off the other road, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was in the middle of nowhere. The places where camp counselors slept had neither electricity nor running water. Some of you are like, I like that. That's fine. I'm not one of those. So in the deep brush of the Ozarks in that area, the sun would come up and you actually would not be able to see first light because of all of the brush, the overhead trees and everything else. So the first summer that I was there, the leader of the camp put ropes. He strung a rope from the, one of the cabin, well, the, the place that I was staying, out to the nearest trail that could get you out of the brush so that in the dark, if your light wasn't working, this was way before you know, cell phones with lights or anything like that, so you didn't count on that, so that you could grab the rope and you could feel your way out to the trail and ultimately towards dawn. Exodus 13 is like that. It is pointers, four pointers past this night that Israel has walked through and frankly, that Israel will keep walking through towards a dawn, towards a dawn that looks beyond their days. God has set up pointers that will last generations for Israel in these four things you see in the outline. There's reminders in the past that are going to point forward. And there's things that are just like going to be echoed throughout the rest of our Bible. So I want you to remember the geography. Let's set a little context here. If, you've, if you're visiting, we're preaching through the book of Exodus. We preach through books of the Bible generally. We try to uh, do that because we believe God has written a book and therefore we're doing it best, we hope, if we're preaching through these books. So, if you remember the geography of Egypt, you've got the Nile River is like the center, center aisle here. And the Nile Delta is like this stage. And then behind us is the Mediterranean. Over here, we have the Red Sea. And then up here is Sinai. All right. So the people of Israel are leaving this place and they're going towards Sinai. We're going to track them a little bit in some of this geography. At very least, at this point, months have passed since the time that the plagues began. If you follow the Mishnah, the Jewish oral tradition, uh, they believe that 12 months passed from the time that Moses showed up to the death of the firstborn. And we have also within the Mishnah, they believe that this particular scene where they're leaving Succoth is taking place on the second Sabbath after the death of the firstborn in the Passover. So whatever, that might be correct, that might not be correct, we have no way of knowing, but certainly at least months, maybe up to a year since Moses has shown up, and then probably days, weeks, that we see some things in the text that this is still happening in the first month since Passover happened, so a few weeks. Whatever the period of time, what has God done in this? He has proven again and again that he is going to punish those that hold out themselves in pride against him. And he's going to protect those that believe in his word, including protecting the Egyptians that believe in his word and shelter themselves despite what Pharaoh commands them to do. God is going to remind Israel of the cost of their redemption, how great and mighty he has been in saving them. So, Let's look at this. I hope you've got a Bible and you're looking at Exodus 13. We're going to be looking intently at the text. 
Here you see our first pointer in our text, pass this to something greater, a greater salvation, the consecrated firstborn. So verses one and two. The Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. And then skipping down to verse 11. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and to your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time to come, your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand, the Lord brought us up out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn of the land in Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us up out of Egypt. This perhaps bizarre and certainly foreign in some sense ritual to our modern ears points past itself. And we have to remember a little bit of the context of Exodus. What's happened 80 years prior? 80 years prior, Pharaoh issued an edict, kill the sons of Israel that are younger than two. And just a few weeks prior, a couple weeks prior, all the firstborn of Egypt were killed. And the firstborn of Israel survived. Why? Why? Because of the blood of the Lamb. Because of the blood of the lamb, God passed over Israel in Goshen and struck the house of the Egyptians. What was the cost of Israel going free? A lamb for every household. Blood was the cost of freedom. It's a pointer to the value that God placed on the firstborn all the way back here in Exodus. I heard Dave talk about it last week. It's a pointer forward to a firstborn son. A lamb without blemish. A firstborn that if you remember early in the gospel accounts, Satan sought to kill through King Herod. And I think this is why it's specifically sons, right? So if you're like, you're a woman here and you're like, well, why not daughters? Like, why not, why not us? Well, I think specifically what's going on here is because there was a promise in Genesis 3.15, a male offspring would come, he would crush the head of the snake, Satan doesn't want that to happen. Satan's on the hunt for millennia to prevent that from happening. And it's included here. The one line of promise of a male offspring comes through the male lineage, lineage, and Satan wants to prevent it from taking place. So let's just take a moment here, right? I think this is appropriate. If you're a firstborn son of your household, whether you're a hundred or you're one, Stand up. Just stand up if you're a firstborn son of your household. Look around. Consider what this would be like for the cost of Israel. God struck the Egyptians dead and paid for you to go free by the cost of a lamb. You can have a seat. Thanks for partaking. Children, Parents, siblings, consider the cost. The cost for the firstborn to be alive. This is why so much attention is paid in Passover and in the upcoming feast that we're going to talk about. Because you see, the biggest deal here is not that the firstborn of Egypt were struck down. The biggest deal here is that The firstborn of Israel survived. Israel's problem is not chiefly that they're enslaved in Egypt. They're taking their slavery with them out of Egypt. Do you get that? That's what Exodus 13 is talking about. 
That's what we see loads and loads in Exodus. Israel is still in bondage to sin. That's the bigger deal. And that's what the Passover lamb points towards and the consecration of the firstborn. What would God do to make sure that Israel would go free from that slavery? Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You remember Luke 2? Joseph and Mary present Jesus in the temple and per Exodus 13, they pour, so they offer two turtle doves. They consecrate their firstborn son and at that consecration, Simeon, who's been hanging out in the temple, waiting for the Lord's Messiah to show up, says, this is the consolation of Israel. And Anna, a little bit later, a prophetess, says, at this moment, seeing this consecration of Jesus, she goes, this, this is the redeemer, the redemption for Jerusalem, for Israel. The price paid to buy back Israel in the consecration of Jesus. In a firstborn son, we see one who was not spared death, that God's people might go free, redeemed by blood. And note too in this text, who is supposed to be there like, hey, generation to generation, pay attention, here's what's going on. Parents are, parents are. Parents are the ones, particularly fathers, who have a privilege and responsibility. Yes, it takes a church to disciple a Christian, but it starts in the home. Every home, a nursery, every church, a garden. This is one of the gracious ways God's, God uses to point our kids to the reality that they too are enslaved. Do you get that, kids? Do you get that, parents? All of humanity enslaved to sin with one hope, one gracious way that God saves his people. And we're here to point our kids to that. And I think in part, I think about this for myself. Like I think about my past before I had kids. I think about how God saved me. And sometimes just frankly, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of my sin. It takes faith to open my mouth and share with my kids what God has saved me from. Do you have that kind of faith, parents? To share the mighty works of God in your life? So that's the first pointer. Look back, remember what God did, the consecration of the firstborn. Look forward and expect that God is gonna bring a redeemer. He will redeem. Now let's look at the second point, the continuing feast, the feast of unleavened bread. Verse three. Then Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you will eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there will be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory." You shall tell your son on that day, it's because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute in its appointed time from year to year. This is basically a repeat of what took place in the middle of chapter 12. Why, why do you repeat something? When you repeat something to your kids, when you repeat something to an employee, when you repeat anything, it's like, remember, emphasize, right? But there's also some differences between these two accounts in chapter 12 and chapter 13, and I think that's important for us, especially the bookend in verse three and verse nine. Why do all of this? What's in the background? What's the thing that's remembered in the, unleavened, the Feast of Unleavened Bread? With a strong hand, God brought you out of this place. With a strong hand, God brought you out of Egypt. Like, what song did we sing when we started out? That's right, 
Pastor Nick read the text ahead of time. He was, he was ready. Okay, this is what's in mind. We have a mighty God. This is the God who told Moses before any of the plagues happened how it was all going to go down. That he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart. That he was going to exalt himself above Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. This is the God who's I am. He is I am. Immutable. More foundational than the laws that we say just like govern our world, like gravity. How could Pharaoh fight against gravity and win? He can't. That's absurd. This is not battle royale of the gods. Drop a hundred gods in and see who wins. God is and all others bow before him. So, the pointer for us here is, I think, where do you doubt that that's true? In what circumstances? What relationships? Against other spiritual forces? Remember the wonderful, mighty works of God, South City's church. Remember like it's a sign on your hand and a memorial between your eyes. Why in this intense way? Look at verse nine, look with me, okay? Verse nine, notice the logic of the passage. It shall be to you as a sign on your hand and a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord might be on your mouth, in your mouth. Why remember? so that you might overflow from your mouth, speaking of God, knowing that he's mighty. What's the evidence that God is big in our calculations about life? We overflow. It comes out of our mouth. So for me personally, uh, your mileage may vary on this particular application. It's part of the reason that I journal I journal like really, really extensively and have for, I just looked, um, you know, probably several times a week since like August of 2002. I was a relatively new Christian then. I had in my head, amidst all the other stuff like pining after girls and being worried about other things of the teenage years, that I wanted to remember what God was doing. And two decades on, looking back, I expected that God would do much. I suspected he would do much. And I can trace the line of grace in the past that gives me hope for the future. So frankly, when I've been depressed, when my friends have died, when people have turned their back on me, or worse, turned their back on God, what has kept me anchored? A past glance at grace, a future gaze that I've got expectation that God's going to keep doing what he's promised, providing for me. Um, I try to do it even, that seems more long-term like journal. I try to do that every week though with what we do here on Sundays. Thanksgiving is around the corner. I know some of you are already fasting. I know Dave is probably already fasting wherever Dave is. Like in preparation for this meal, right? It was like a big deal. It was a, an instituted meal to provide, to give thanks for what happened over the last year. We have a bigger meal. Doesn't feel like much of a meal because of the size of it, but there's a bigger deal kind of meal that we come to every week. The meal that I think all the feasts in the Old Testament point towards, especially the Passover feast and the feast of the unleavened bread. We have an opportunity every week looking forward to expect, God, what are you gonna do this week? What are you gonna do this week? to look back and remember what has happened, to keep short accounts with him. If you want to call it this way, you probably didn't come from, maybe you did, but like this is God's ordained way of having an altar call every week, right? That the church has followed for millennia. To keep short accounts with him, with short accounts with each other. And in that remembrance, you can remember all the other good things his mighty hand has done. As you come forward and take communion, do you do so remembering the mighty works of God? I think that's mainly what it's about. Sometimes, you know, the way we fence the table, you know, be careful about bitterness, be careful about sin. You can perhaps obscure 
that this is about remembering what God has done in redeeming us chiefly, proclaiming his death until he comes again. So a couple big ropes, a couple big connectors connecting Israel to the past, the consecration of the firstborn and the celebration of this feast. But then there's an even deeper cut and a third pointer. Not to 80 years before, not to a few days before, but four centuries plus. And this one points really clearly towards eternity. Check out pointer three, an ancestor's bones, verse 17 through 19. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. Just a quick note about the geography again. So God sends them the long way. They've left you know, Goshen, probably the northern part towards the, the Nile Delta up here. And they could go kind of that way, kind of leftward towards Sinai. But the Philistines are in the southern part of the land of Canaan. And our God's a merciful God. But if you're familiar with the geography and you see like God makes them go right. He makes them go right. What, what's, what's there? The Red Sea. Okay. Don't go fight the Philistines. God knows their heart, right? Get your back up against the sea. If you're reading Exodus 13, you're, there's, there should be like a sense of expectation here. Like, oh wait, God's merciful. He's going to put their back up against the sea? Yes. Yes. Because he knows their hearts. He knows what's actually going on in their hearts and he knows what will happen. They'll want to run back to the slavery of Egypt if at this point in their history they endure war, if they have to fight. They're not expected to fight for themselves. That'll come later. No, God is going to fight for them. This mighty, good, gracious God is merciful, merciful, merciful. Loads of mercy in this Exodus text. And we have to keep a note in mind. This is just a pin. Keep this in mind. Somebody else will build on this later. It's not for me today. They're going to grumble a whole bunch after they get across the Red Sea. And God's going to keep being merciful with them. But at a certain point, it switches. He doesn't tolerate their grumbling anymore. God's disposition well, something happens later in Exodus, and I'll let Dave handle it. Just keep that in mind. God's merciful to them, but something's going to switch here, and he'll still be merciful, but he will also be severe later. Now, to this point, to this pointer, what's significant here ties into the very end of Genesis, which we preached through, um, we finished last year. Jacob, Joseph's father, Jacob named Israel, didn't want to be buried in Egypt. He wanted to return and be buried in the promised land of Canaan. Joseph told the Israelites, pass it down from generation to generation. Make sure my bones don't stay in Egypt. How, how do they know all this was going to go down? Because all the way back in Genesis 15, a hundred years before even that with Joseph, God told Abraham all that was going to go down. You're going to be here. Your people will become great in Egypt. The Egyptians are going to enslave them. And then I'm going to visit them and get them out. That had been passed down from generation to generation. The promise of God, of his people in his place where he would be present with them is why the faithful of old wanted to be in the promised land. The, we read Hebrews 11, 23 and several, te, several verses following that. The verse right before that, Hebrews eleven twenty two tells us that by faith, Joseph gave instructions concerning his bones. What's that about? How is that an act of faith? Abraham wanted to be buried in the promised land. Jacob wanted to be buried there. Joseph too. Now, 
the text is not 100% clear. But Hebrews 11, if you read it, what's all their hope about? Their hope is in a city made without hands. Or Hebrews 13, like they're looking for a city to come, a place to come, a resurrected earth. I think it's not too far a conjecture to say, why do they want to be buried in the promised land? They're anticipating a resurrection to come. It's the way that Stephen talks about it in Acts 7. Joseph had a hope, a hope without all the details that something further was going to come and that death, the grave, was not the end. And I think that hope of resurrection is why Moses took the bones of Joseph with them. Now, there's loads of principles we could derive from this. Do you have a will? Do you have a living? You know, you know, like, do you prepare for death, perhaps? I think it's most importantly this. What kind of legacy are we li- leaving? What kind of legacy are you leaving when you're gone? What kind of faith would have stirred up in Israel when Joseph told them, don't leave my bones in Egypt? What kind of faith would have stirred up in Israel when Moses was sure to take those bones. It was 10 years ago when a young friend died suddenly. Some of you were there, some of you remember this. And his funeral was just a week or two later. We all discovered that three months before he died, he had planned his funeral in full. All the songs, he was, he was young, he was in his early 20s. All the songs the text that was going to be preached, even a direct word to those present. Not with any anticipation he would die. He was young, fit, healthy. It was 10 years ago that I started at the beginning of every year to write goodbye letters to each of my family members. And two, 10 years ago, wrote a goodbye letter to then South Campus, now South Cities, and every year I write a new one. Why? It's an act of faith. It's about the legacy I want to leave behind. It's about the hope of resurrection, that we will be resurrected in Christ when he comes. Do you plan to pass on a legacy, even in your death? So these pointers, consecrated firstborn, a continuing feast, and these ancestors' bones, all point forward to Jesus. And now, the last thing, a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. Maybe the most striking thing, all these things are striking, but perhaps the most striking thing in our text. Verses 20 through 22. And they moved on from Succoth and encamped on Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. The last pointer in the text is this pillar so that Israel can keep moving regardless of whether it's day or night. Now, we've seen the presence of God described as fire in Genesis and in Exodus. You think about the, the burning bush or the, the flaming fire outside of Eden. But this is the first time that this Hebrew word for cloud is used to talk about the presence of God. But it certainly is not the last time. I mean, in Exodus 19, just a few weeks from now, when we get there, the presence of God is going to descend in fire and lightning on Sinai. In Exodus 40, God's glory, described as a cloud, is going to show up in the tabernacle. We're going to see glimpses of this in the temple and in the prophets. Certainly saw a bit of it in Revelation. The greatness of God, dangerous for those who draw near without their sins atoned for. The greatness of God, Glory and blessing for those whose sins are covered. This greatness and dangerous of God here in our text points towards other instances. Do you remember Luke 9? Jesus on a Mount of Transfiguration, probably not Sinai, probably something closer to Jerusalem, and Moses and Elijah show up and a cloud descends over the mountain and God the Father speaks over his son. Glory in Jesus but also Luke 21. Speak plainly, say that you're the Christ. I am, and you will see me coming in the cloud with great glory and power. 
This pillar of light, this pillar of in, in light and dark, fire, cloud. I mean, the author of Hebrews earlier says that the rock that was with the people of Israel that Moses struck was Christ. We can't really pull apart you know, the Trinity and all of this, but certainly we should see Jesus here in this. The glorious presence of God here in our text points forward to the glorious presence of Christ with his people, for his people, because God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, a Passover lamb, that we might be resurrected in the promised land. Not a narrow strip in, in Palestine. But like what Paul says in Romans 4, that Abraham's faith and all those that have the same faith as him, they inherit the world, a resurrected world and universe. To believe in Christ is what all these promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph, to Moses, to Israel points towards. His is the glory and the power in this pillar of cloud and fire. His presence with his people, continuing to save them not only from their enemies, but from their sins and from death. The question for Israel was, on this long exodus, do you believe? And that is the exact same question for us today. Do you believe? Do you believe? Lord, help our unbelief. So this twilight of Israel's history, long before the dawn that would come in Christ, points towards that later fulfillment. Israel perhaps expected a twilight, but God was going to string up some ropes to make sure they made it to the trail so that they could see. But what we've inherited in Christ is so much greater than that. It's the way that Peter talks about it in 1 Peter uh, 1, 10 through 12, that the Old Testament saints, the prophets, they wanted to know what we know, that angels can't quite wrap their minds around what we have. We have inherited so much. So in conclusion, I think it's just right to say, like, I mean, this is just, I think, natural to human existence. We're always looking to greener grass, aren't we? I remember when I was a kid, I was like, like a little kid, I was like, man, I hope I'm a, I want to be a teenager. Then when I was a teenager, I was like, I can't wait to be an adult. I talked to some of you now, you know, you're, you're retired. You're like, man, I miss the good old days, right? I don't know. I'm in, I'm in my 40s now. My knees feel a certain way. It doesn't feel like the good old days, all right? We're constantly looking beyond where we are for the if only. And perhaps by analogy, we would say like, maybe you're like, man, my doubts would all be gone if I saw a pillar of fire and cloud. If I saw the plagues descend on Egypt, I, I believe. No, you would not. Did Israel believe? By and large, no. The key essential thing in our belief is not something circumstantially exterior to us. It's something internal to us. Though Israel saw everything they saw, they kept walking in darkness and even let go of the rope to get off into the brush. Though all we've seen is a people, maybe what you've seen is an individual, we best be careful. This is Hebrews 3. Lest there be an evil, unbelieving heart that hardens you against God, speak truth to one another. Cling to truth now. Be grateful for when we live. Be grateful for all the past grace. And be on guard. Be on guard for the things ahead. But also, full of faith that we have a good God who will keep us. If we have faith and keep on having faith in Christ, we live not only in the dawn, but in light. The same God who in wonder struck down the Egyptians, passed over his people, has passed over us in Christ. And in passing over us in his wrath, he draws near to us in his glory. He didn't spare his son. So what the author of Romans, Paul says, is how will he not graciously give us with him all things? Who's gonna bring a charge against you if you are God's elect? If God's not gonna condemn you, who gets to condemn you? No one. No one. 
Not even your own heart. It's what the author of 1 John, the Apostle John tells us. Think about it this way in this, as we're closing here, think about it in these kind of earthly terms. If you are a child of an earthly family, though it would be extreme, you could be disowned, right? You could be disowned from an earthly family. There's no parallel in God's family. There's no disowning. Those that he purchased with his blood, those that he brought into his presence, no one plucks them from his hand. All the promises are ours in Christ. What does Christ get? Everything. And if you're in Christ, you get it all with him too. And that's what communion points towards. An inheritance in Christ. Not only being spared from death that we deserved because of the blood of not just any lamb, but the lamb, but it also points towards receiving all of the gracious gifts he's gonna grant to us, to those who trust in his son. Not only are sins canceled, but the whole universe granted to us. That's what this meal points towards. Now, sometimes I hear, and we fence the table, I'll do it here in a second, like we, we place some barriers and some guardrails on partaking in it. But just consider again what the Feast of Unleavened Bread and what the text says about that. What was that for? For remembering the mighty works of God. There's a way in which perhaps I could get sidelined thinking about my own sin, my own bitterness, and not in faith come forward and say, God, look at all the things you've done. Look at your mighty works. And let that sort everything else out. Luther said it this way in, in thinking about communion. If you feel you're unfit, you're weak, you're lacking in faith this Lord's Day morning, where are you going to obtain strength except here? Do you mean to wait until you're pure, you're strong, you're spotless? Well, then you'll never come to him. You will never obtain any benefit from Holy Communion. The right use of the Lord's Supper is not torture, but comfort and gladness. For by giving it to us, God didn't intend it to torture or frighten, poison us. The supper welcomes those who perceive their frailties and feel they are not pious, not holy, yet would like to be in light of who he is. So I hope as you come here in a moment, you do so with your eyes set mainly on Look at all he's done for us in Christ. So as we approach the Lord's table, just a few words. If you want to stay in your seat and receive the elements, the ushers are prepared to pass those around. You can raise your hand and they will bring you the pre-packaged elements. Otherwise, the elements are here at the front. The way we do it, if you're a visitor, is we take this center aisle and the two against the wall and we come forward and we treat the two side idols here as return uh, things, just in case, like, like, occasionally I see visitors, like, bump into people or others, like, be gracious with, with each other, okay, guys? Now, this meal is a meal of faith. If you are not yet trusting in Christ, it's not a meal for you as of yet. Come talk to me. You're surrounded by Christians that love Jesus. Talk to them about what this means. If you are here today and you're harboring sin in such a way, like harboring it, hiding it, wanting it more than Jesus, not just aware that you're a sinner, I hope you all are, but knowing that you really just want this sin and you really don't want it dealt with. This is a table where you know, I would warn you, just be careful, don't come forward. If you have bitterness in your heart towards other Christians, especially in this room, and again, mainly about what you're willing to do with that, not just a bro breaking of fellowship, but like you know in your conscience you're embittered against someone. Be careful. This is the other warning that Paul issues in 1 Corinthians 11. But this is a dangerous thing to come forward. But if your heart is set in faith in the mighty works of God, you're okay with him dealing with all those things. It's part of what you want to do. And this is a meal to be partaken in by faith. 
So what I'm going to do is give just a 30 seconds or a minute or so, give you a chance to examine your own heart, give you a chance to ponder the mighty works of God in the cross, in Exodus, and in your own life. And then I will say the words of institution. You'll be free to come forward when you're ready. So let's take one minute here. Just ponder God's works in our own heart. Hear the words of institution from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Come as you're ready. Come ready to feast with the Lord.